Professor Roy Richard Grinker. You are a professor of anthropology at George Washington University and editor-in-chief of Anthropological Quarterly. You also broke rank with your family. You come from a family of four generations of psychoanalysis. Your great-grandfather, your grandfather, and your father were psychoanalysis, and you decided to go into anthropology. Honestly, I don't know how come they didn't disown you or at the very least send you for psychiatric help. So, Professor Grinker, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, they weren't too, uh, too happy about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I thought they were such giants in their field. I was uh, a little insecure and didn't want to compete with them. And I, you know, there's a a kind of evolutionary principle, a Darwinian principle, which is that uh, you don't compete with somebody by emulating them. You compete by emphasizing your differences. Wow, I never heard of that principle before, but just for the uh, uh, listeners, we're here to, to talk about your new book, Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. So, uh, so let's start with your background. Uh, we just spoke that you, you come from a family of uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, can you tell us, and you tell us some early stories of your childhood. Can, can we start with some of those stories? Well, sure. You know, as a child, um, I was very um, early on exposed to ideas about the mind. Um, there were pictures and busts of Sigmund Freud in my house, in my grandfather's house, and I, I grew up across the street from my grandfather. And he was an unusual person, my grandfather, not only in being such a pioneer in psychiatry, but because whenever he talked to children, he talked to them like they were adults. And even at, at the age of, say, 10, 11 years old, I would have Saturday afternoon uh, seminars with him about psychiatry. So I was raised to believe that mental illness was not something to be stigmatized, that mental illness was something that every human being would encounter in some degree. Sometimes it was serious, but sometimes it was more mild and self-limiting. But regardless, it was something that was universal and nothing to be ashamed of. Right. It's almost like, well, if that's what you see every day, for you it's normal. It's, it's for example, for an accountant. An accountant sees people who are doing well financially and people who are struggling, but he sees the whole diversity and not everyone fits into a mind frame of uh, everyone earns, I don't know, $50,000 a year and have all their bill pays. No, some people struggle and some people do much better than that. Yeah. Okay, so I compare you coming out as an, an anthropologist as a glue kid coming to his parents and say, mom, dad, I'm gay. <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you tell us how did it go? Or how did your family take it when they found out that you were not going to follow their footsteps? Well, it's not like there was one day where I said, okay, it's off. I'm not going to be doing psychiatry. Uh, they realized slowly, gradually, by the courses I was taking in, uh, in college and the kinds of things I was telling them that I was heading in a different direction. But what I did was I made sure that they understood that what anthropology offered was a way to step outside of a particular discipline and look at it in a new light critically. In Nobody's Normal, I talk about Plato's famous allegory of the prisoners who are held in a cave and they never can see a human. They only can only see the shadows of the people who are behind them uh, cast by the firelight. And so they think that the shadows that they see are actual beings when in fact it's just the representation or the shadow. And what anthropology does is it helps us to reveal that the shadow has been created and that what we think of as reality is often what we've just accepted to be that way. And so that's what anthropology does. It steps outside and says, what are the shadows? What are the things that, we're, the, that we think are real when in fact we've constructed them and we've made them? And that goes for uh, any field of medicine or any science that the anthropologist can look outside and, and see that it's actually made and it's not in nature and it's not always some kind of truth.
Uh, in regards to anthropologies, uh, anthropology, I, I have to admit, I had a stigma against anthropology. My first girlfriend in college, she was studying anthropology and I was studying business. So I'm the old utilitarian, I'm gonna make lots of money. And what are you gonna do with your life? Are you gonna be a secretary? Because that's what I told her. And of course she proved me wrong. She, uh, <laughs> she first of all, the first smart thing that she did, she, she left me. So, and then she, she got a nice career. She teaching at a college. She went back uh, to Hungary where she studies, so where she is from. Uh, but there is a stigma against anthropology. Uh, do you find that yourself or were you always uh, no, it's uh, funny. a well-built career? Funny that you bring up that question because uh, my first girlfriend uh, told me not to take anthropology because my freshman year in college, I was not a very serious student and she loved the anthropology professors. And she said, I don't want you to take those courses because you're a screw up and you don't deserve to take such great courses. And so it was out of spite, almost out of spite that I said, well, I'll show you, I'm gonna take anthropology. Uh, but no, my grandfather, who was really my, my, my major you know, intellectual influence, uh, was a big fan of anthropology. Um, he, uh, knew Margaret Mead. He knew uh, sociologists very well, famous sociologists like Talcott Parsons and uh, Gregory Bateson. And so um, it wasn't a, a field that was unusual to them, particularly because psychiatry was so stigmatized, right? So if you're, if you're a psychiatrist, you already feel like you're at the margins, that other medical doctors didn't take you seriously that you have a soft science, you know, that you, you do too much interpretation. You, you can't diagnose a mental illness with a laboratory test, right? So I think it would have taken a lot for my family to stigmatize anthropology since they were already feeling marginalized within the medical profession. Okay, well, uh, okay, so tell us about your career as an anthropologist and how you ended up being a professor at George Washington University. Well, it's interesting, you know, when I was trained uh, in cultural anthropology in the early to um, mid 1980s at Harvard, if you wanted to do any kind of study that actually helped people, that had a social impact, you weren't really considered a real scholar. Mm. You should work at the high levels of theory and um, philosophical, with philosophical concerns. If you really got down to doing something that was going to address real world social problems, you weren't considered as serious a scholar. Um, so my first field work had nothing to do with trying to apply knowledge to solve a problem. My first field work was in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, two years of field work, uh, looking at the complicated social relationships between uh, the um, FA pygmy hunter gatherers and the Lesse farmers. I lived two years in the rainforest um, with, with them. And it was only later that I started to think about how I could use anthropology to influence people's thinking about um, actual um, policy or how to understand mental illness or how to understand marginalization or discrimination. So that came kind of much later. Right, right. Okay, so uh, throughout this process, also you have written several books. Can you tell us uh, the previous work that you have done? And then after that, could you tell us who, how is it that you became particularly interested in mental illness? So I kind of write books as I get passionate about it. Uh, not because I have some single line of research that I've been carrying out through my whole career, right? So when I could no longer go to Sub-Saharan Africa, well, at least to the place I was doing research because of political and economic problems, um, I visited a friend in Korea. Um, I was dating a woman who was um, born and raised in Korea. Uh, I went and I loved Korea and I ended up doing a lot of research and writing a book on North-South Korean relations. Then one day, I'm in my office and a huge number of boxes come in from a, a deceased anthropologist's estate. And I read through them and they were fascinating. And I wrote a biography of him uh, called In the Arms of Africa. But it was in 1994 when my 
eldest daughter was diagnosed with autism that I really got working on mental health and mental illness because I realized at that time that so few people uh, knew much about autism outside of North America and Western Europe, that our knowledge was really limited. And that's when I started to do this cross-cultural work of looking at autism and disability and psychiatric issues across the globe. Wow. Um, so you tell us about the history of mental in illness and how uh, we started using this label, uh, I guess, uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, if I, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. So can you tell us about that label? Where does it come from? When did we start labeling people as having a mental illness? You know, there's an old um, famous line from a, a British novelist that the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Well, just as other cultures don't necessarily separate illnesses uh, into distinctly mental ones or physical ones. Mm -hmm. Neither did we in Western civilization do that until the onset of the Industrial Revolution and the influence of philosophers like Rene Descartes, who posited that there, were, a, there was a difference between the mind and the body, and that one could have distinctly mental illnesses as opposed to um, illnesses that were of both the body and mind. And I think that we've been struggling with that difference between illnesses of the body and illnesses of the mind for um, the last couple of centuries, and that the stigma of mental illness is often linked to or rooted in that distinction, because we can say, well, we can value uh, mental illnesses differently than we value physical illnesses. Just think about how many people might go to a doctor with a physical complaint that is emotional in uh, origin. And if the doctor says, maybe you could get some help from a psychotherapist, they get outraged. Like, you're saying it's in my head, I'm making it up, um, that I should just snap out of it, that I'm not really sick. Um, we wouldn't have that kind of reaction to the um, proposition that our bodies and minds are related like this if we hadn't had this long history of separation. Wow. And also you mentioned that it's actually it's not a biology, it's our culture. So little by little we start isolating or, or, or separating or telling these kind of people are different because they act or, or behave in such a way. And we are not born like this. We are not born with this stigma that we learn from other people as we grow, as we grow into society. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And because we've created it, you know, we can change it. Because we, right. we teach it, we can teach something different. Right. And what are some of the most common mental illness that we may encounter out there in the world? Well, the most common mental illnesses are depression and anxiety. Um, but prevalence rates of various conditions vary. Um, what is of particular concern though to clinicians and researchers is that there are some very serious mental illnesses that often end up in suicide and in experiencing homelessness. Now schizophrenia is much less common, for example, than attention deficit disorder, depression, or anxiety, yet um, it remains one of the most highly stigmatizing. And one of the reasons for that one of the reasons for that is that we tend to stigmatize those conditions that threaten our most cherished values of what makes a person a good person. And in the history of Western civilization, we've idealized the person who is completely responsible for themselves, an individual, autonomous, not dependent on anyone else. And schizophrenia, and I should mention also um, addictions, threaten that ideal of autonomy and independence. So that's where we see the greatest stigma, shame, secretiveness of mental illnesses, and yet those are among the most severe. Wow, and there are things that are really not mental Ill illness, but people categorize them as such. For example, being gay. At one time, you were, uh, people were being sent to an institution where they will fix you up because definitely there had to be something wrong with your, with yeah. your head. And, and of course, with sexual, yeah. uh, sexual. I mean, even, um, I write in the Nobody's Normal, uh, that um, people who were given lobotomies, women, uh, because they didn't conform to gender roles. You wow. know, so that was a, a, like a brain sickness if you, you know, like to read and wanted to have a profession and go to college. Um, 
it, I mean, it was really extraordinary how certain kinds of mental illness treatments, particularly serious ones like lobotomy, were used to try to enforce gender norms. And um, think of how many people suffered from the idea that homosexuality, just loving somebody who happens to be of the same sex, was turned into a mental illness that needed to be treated. Yes, I, that it comes uh, to my mind that the, I saw a movie, this guy in World War I in England, the one who, I guess, discovered or made up the computer that broke the codes from, from the Nazi. He was gay and he was a national hero, but he ended up committing suicide because he was discovered to be gay. And, uh, and it was considered, of course, a mental illness and that he couldn't overcome. Turing. Yes. Turing, yes, exactly. Uh, but nowadays, um, uh, people are coming out, they are accepting, well, I have a psychiatrist, I go for, to him or her for help, and there are even some, uh, what if say, popular figures in our societies, athletes, uh, stars, movie stars. So can you tell us uh, some of these, uh, first of all, how is it that now it's becoming more acceptable? What was is there a turning point that announcing to the world that I have uh, depression, for example, became acceptable? You know, we, we don't really have a great handle on why things are so much better now in terms of be, people being open. But one of the things I talk about in the book is how over the course of the last couple of decades, we've reconceptualized mental illnesses to be spectrums or continua rather than categorical. You have something or you don't have something. So if you have this idea that maybe we're all a little bit of, of obsessive compulsive somewhere along the spectrum, if you have the idea that, um, that there is a continuum from sadness to depression, then you are less likely to think about those as branded labels that somebody's going to have for the rest of their lives. A continuum is something we move along and we can change over time. And so, you know, my daughter might be looking for a new roommate and the roommate says, you know, I'm a little bit OCD. I like things to be neat. Now, when that person says that, they don't mean that they actually have obsessive compulsive disorder, but they're using this concept uh, with an idea of the spectrum and it disarms the power of that word to stigmatize somebody who in fact is seriously impaired um, and cannot function very well in life because of this condition and needs and deserves treatment. Uh, you know, uh, here, okay, there's a big problem. There's a lot of homeless people outside on the streets. And many of these people, they're suffering from mental illness and they are not getting help. Uh, I, I, I don't know how much this is related to what you do, but is there any way that these people can get help on the streets? Uh, the one who see ghosts or speak to spirits and they definitely need help, but you know, no one will give them a job. No one will take care of them and they're just there, I guess, to rot. You know, the issue of homelessness in the United States is, is really complicated. Um, at one time, people were in asylums yes. and they were cared for in asylums, but many asylums were deplorable institutions. And when John F. Kennedy passed the community health, is that it's just hard to get psychiatric care anywhere. Um, can I interrupt you? Uh, there was a little cut off. And, I noticed that. Okay, so you were saying when J.F. Kennedy and then it cut off. Okay, uh, that when John F. Kennedy passed the Community Mental Health Act in 1963, the last act before his assassination, um, he thought that by moving people out of asylums and into communities, the community would take care of them and people would be much better off. But in reality, 
it's hard to say whether they were better off because they were essentially dumped onto the streets because of inadequate funding at the community level. And the other problem with homelessness is that it's hard for anybody to get mental health care. I mean, if I today decide I need to see a psychiatrist and I'm a professor at George Washington University, it's gonna be hard for me to get an appointment, let alone somebody who's really struggling to eke out just a subsistence. Wow. Um, in respect to community, so here in North America, we tend to isolate uh, people who have mental illness, but that's not the case. You travel a lot and in other societies, they are just maybe a little bit different, but they are not isolated. They are still members of the community. Can you highlight some of the differences from North America to other of the societies that you have visited? Yeah, one of the best ways to explain the differences across cultures is through the um, World Health Organization studies of schizophrenia. Those studies found that throughout the world, there was a pretty similar prevalence of schizophrenia, 1% or so of the population, but that the severity of their psychoses, the severity, the frequency of episodes, and the outcomes like marrying or having a job were very different because different societies handle things in different ways. And so in non-industrial societies, where you have a lot of social supports and maybe you have large families that live together on a farm, people tend to do better than in a place like you know, uh, in the US, in, in, uh, in Washington DC, or in, in England, in London, where people tend to be isolated and lonely. And if there's one thing we know helps people with serious mental illnesses, it's social supports. And so when I've traveled around the world, I often see people who are, have you know, pretty serious mental illnesses, but it's not to say that they're treated well all the time, but they are cared for and they're not, they don't tend to be exiled completely from their communities the way we started to do in the industrial revolution, which is to say, well, if this person can't live up to our standards of the ideal autonomous independent capitalist, they better go to this asylum. Right. Okay. Well, two other years, as you mentioned, we have seen these improvements. People are less stigmatized than before, and and some of our differences are becoming as as part of being normal. If you have a crystal ball, can you tell us what's the what's the future of people with mental illness? I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm really optimistic. Okay. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing mental illnesses as uh, something that is a part of the human condition rather than a sign of weakness. And I think that the COVID pandemic is helping us with that, actually. I mean, I'm not saying the COVID pandemic is good, but there's often a silver lining in any crisis. And it is possible that this um, COVID uh, pandemic, and I've written about this in an opinion piece uh, just yesterday posted on CNN, that um, it is a universalizing stressor. There's nobody who's immune from the stresses of COVID. And it's created a kind of empathy so that if you're stressed out and you want to have help because you're depressed or you're anxious or you're traumatized in this pandemic, nobody's gonna look at you and say, oh, you're a shameful, weak person because we're all experiencing that stress. And so, one of the things I talk about in Nobody's Normal is how when we have periods of global crisis, like world wars or pandemics, we tend to see big improvements in reducing the stigma of mental illness. Wow, okay, so this, uh, this is, I promise this is the last question. So in, in regards to COVID, I assume, or I have uh, seen in the news that there is now an immense amount of people asking for help. Uh, I guess that helps to reduce the stigma, but at the same time, how are people dealing with this overwhelming demand of help? One thing that's happening is that um, clinicians have ramped up to do teletherapy mm. and they seem to be doing a pretty good job of it. And that's facilitating a larger number of patients to be seen. But again, there's much more supply, or sorry, much more demand than there is supply. And it is really a major mental health uh, crisis. A recent study of 69 million medical records in the United States showed that 18% of people who test positive for COVID within three months of their test 
uh, meet the criteria for a mental illness. 5% of people after their COVID test within three months have a first onset mental illness. They've never had one before. And that there is a risk of contracting COVID that is higher among people with a pre-existing mental illness. So this is a serious crisis and one that really should be addressed at the highest levels of the government. Yet there has not been a mental health scientist in any COVID task force to date in either the previous president's administration or the current one. Well, let's hope this administration will keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so uh, Professor Ginker, last question. Can you tell us one more time the name of the book and where people can find it? Sure, the book is called Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. And it's available at most bookstores and of course on Amazon. And if you like the book, you read it and like it, let Amazon know, put a rating up there or tweet it out. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I, I'm the first one to confess that I'm not normal either. So thank you so much. Right. For this. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Fun talking to you.